Why on January 6th, when it has now publicly been admitted by the FBI that they had information that there could possibly be a situation like that at the United States Capitol, why weren't the cabinet secretaries under President Trump briefed? Why didn't the FBI put a thousand uniformed agents around the U.S. Capitol? Where was the fence? Right. These are the lackings of that led to January 6th. These are the mistakes, intentional or otherwise, that led to January 6th. And if you look at the video from January 6th, and they still won't release all of it, an entire side of the Capitol, I believe it's the south side, was totally unmanned. No police officers whatsoever. And that's where the crowd first came in through. And you have to ask yourself, what happened on January 6th? Now, look, I was chief of staff of the Department of Defense on the 6th. We had offered the Capitol Police and Mayor Bowser of Washington, D.C., thousands of National Guardsmen and women two days before January 6th, and they turned us down. So it could have been prevented. So could it, could it have been just not, not a lot of information sharing happening? I think it was not enough information sharing happening. And I think what people now are starting to realize is that the protecting of the U.S. Capitol on a day like January 6th is a law enforcement function. You cannot have the United States military descend and occupy the area around the United States Capitol. It's literally illegal. But they can assist their law enforcement partners through a request from the mayor or the governor or the Capitol Police. And that's what should have happened. And that's what we told them they might want to consider, but they flat out rejected it for political reasons, I believe. So, and, and to add to our discussions on the events of January 6th, when I was serving as chief of staff at the Defense Department, I had the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Secretary of the Army, who the National Guard reports to, create a written timeline that they all signed off on as to the events that unfolded 48 hours prior, all the way through January 6th and into the next day, so that the American public in Congress would have an actual TikTok signed off by the three most important leaders in the Defense Department as of their actions and the actions of our employees. And so it shows, minute by minute, the calls that were placed to Mayor Bowser when we went to the Capitol Police, our meeting, me and the SECDEF and the chairman meeting with the President of the United States two days before, where he authorized the use of up to 10 or 20,000 National Guardsmen and women around the country should law enforcement make that request. So we had that request ahead of time from the president. And that was part one of what the law requires. Part two is a request from local government. And it shows when we, the Defense Department, preemptively went to local government and said, in case you guys need us, we're ready to go now, but we need your request. And they said, we don't need you. And I think those actions have been overlooked by too many. And these congressional inquiries they're doing, they purposely don't want to look at what actually happened uh, because the incident could have been prevented, should never have happened, and it was a failure of law enforcement on that day, mostly the FBI. And so just to, to, to dig on this a little tiny bit, because it's interesting, um, what prompted you to issue such a large possible deployment of National Guard? Well, so... The, the ethos in the United States military is prepare for the worst, hope for the best, right, uh, to put it mildly. So we knew from uh, just the media cycle, and, and I'll give you a perfect example. It's not like this intelligence was classified. Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts were all closed. They were all boarded up on January 6th. It's not like they had better information than the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who's in responsible for domestic intelligence. Right. People had an idea that something bad could happen. So we prepared and we know it takes us days to mobilize 10, 20,000 National Guardsmen and women. We have to pull them out of their daily lives, away from their families, dress them, rehearse them, train them and then deploy them. So that's why we acted early, because we knew we couldn't do it at the call at the drop of a dime on the day of the incident. And that's what people are now just starting to realize, that it was a law enforcement function where you could have staged federal law enforcement, the FBI, DHS, what have you, agents, and they should have built a fence around the Capitol prior to January 6th, and this event could have been avoided. I can't even remember exactly where this comes from, to be perfectly honest, but I've seen it described in a number of, uh, in a number of publications that there was a concern about optics. Of course. Right? And this, so the idea, just the idea of having 
you know, National Guard in such numbers deployed um, visually mm. would, was something that, uh, you know, w w wasn't acceptable. Well, then that's, and I, for me, that's a political position. And optics have to give way, become secondary to protecting American citizens when you have information that leads you to believe they might be in danger, especially on a day like January 6th. And so the optics argument, I, I, I disagree with completely because the safety of the members of Congress and the safety of the American public on a day like that have to be the priority and not what it looks like. And there are many ways that we could, we didn't have people, we don't have them in, with machine guns, with weapons. We didn't even have any of our guardsmen armed. We just had them in uniform with the bright yellow jackets doing traffic control. So there's ways to tamp it down and control the optics if that's what you want to do. So, so let's let's kind of jump back to talking about this, uh, you know, uptick in crime. Specifically, mm -hmm. the the murder rates are, you know, essentially, I mean, it, it it's just such a huge increase that it's impossible to miss if you if you absolutely. Yeah, the murder rates for cities like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta, and other major cities across the U.S. are up a minimum, a minimum of 30% year over year for the last 18 months. And basically, it's impossible to not notice, as you said. That's a lot more people dying in America due to criminal activity than ever before. And so even places like New York, which just basically finished their, their primary for their mayoral candidate, right? And the Democratic candidate who won the primary on the Democratic side is a former police officer whose campaign was, we need more law enforcement. That's what he ran on. That should tell you everything you need to know. The Democrat in the most populous city in the United States of America uh, coming off the heels of de Blasio's failed policies on law enforcement, ran on the opposite and said, we need to fund the police. We need more law enforcement because that city has seen a 55% increase in homicides. That's crazy and unacceptable if you're a New Yorker. And it should, it should alert the rest of the nation that the policies that they were floating for political reasons have not worked. So, but of course, these are actually local policies, right? You, this, mm -hmm. this is interesting. You know, you suggested there's this kind of, uh, you know, national push. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's local policies that mm -hmm. are impacted. Um, how does that work in your mind? So I think the local policies are just basically replicated the, throughout the country in cities that have chosen to defund the police and they sort of just spill over into our most populous areas. So like, like Los Angeles has implemented these same policies about bail and about defunding the police and about reducing criminal penalties. They've done that in, in uh, Atlanta. They've done that in Portland. They've done that in Chicago. They've done that. So when you have your most populated regions with, um, in the United States committing more crime than has been committed in recent history, it's going to connect across the United States and people are going to start seeing those connections. It's not just a one-off. It's not one city in one state is seeing this explosion in crime. It's unfortunately across the United States. So before we jump into another topic, Cash, any, any quick thoughts on how this can be resolved? Oof, I wish there were. <laughs> well, actually, I take that back. It's it's not a complicated fix. To tamp down criminal activity, you have to prop up your support for law enforcement and the judicial process. As a former federal public defender and a federal prosecutor, having been on both sides of the aisle and adjudicating that process, you cannot allow a 50% increase in homicides. You cannot allow an increase in narco trafficking through our streets. And the only way you tamp that down and reduce it is by putting law enforcement and police back on the streets to investigate and to arrest when they see criminal activity and give them the tools and resources they need so they do their jobs. I mean, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a whole outfit in Portland, Oregon, uh, a unit of an entire police department that resigned. A hundred officers resigned because they are afraid that they cannot perform the duties that they signed up to do 
with the laws that they have been given um, by the local law enforcement. And that's just one example. But you can't allow that type of behavior to occur in the cities across America. And that's how you have to allow a greater exchange of evidence as well. And that's sort of my point from the January 6th stuff. If you're, if you're mandating that, not mandating, or if you're, you're saying that, which I am, that federal agencies should have shared some of the intelligence they had, like the FBI should have shared the intelligence they had about events leading up to January 6th, because it wasn't that hard to find. It was all over Twitter and the internet. Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks found it. Um, they should have taken a more exhaustive approach and a more preparatory approach with DHS and called in other cabinet officials and said, this is a law enforcement function. It's our job to protect the citizens and the United States Capitol, and this is what we're doing to prepare. And they totally failed, 100%. I mean, and I just flip it on the reverse for people who say, well, Cash, why didn't the United States military do it? And where was the NSA and where was the CIA? Those are not domestic intelligence agencies. They don't, they weren't built and constructed to surveil uh, local law enforcement matters. And same with the U.S. military. They are there to fight overseas and protect the borders of our nation. Um, and in a rare instance, allow the National Guard to help local law enforcement authorities. I think it was a total, total failure on law enforcement on that day. And I was on the phone calls on January 4th, 5th, and 6th with the president, with the chief of staff, with the uh, attorney general, with the Department of Homeland Security, and the only person missing from that, those phone calls was the director of the FBI. He was nowhere to be found. 